Um, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Zoltan Kutelik, who's um, who leads a statistical genetics group in, in Lausanne. Um, I won't say much, but just to say is, uh, I've often found it quite difficult to understand a lot of things in statistical genetics, and I've always been really admiring of um, Zoltan's intellectual generosity and uh, excited to hear what he has to say about advances in the randomization today. Thanks. Thank it's a really pleasure to be back in Bristol. I understand it was pandemic. It's really cool to finally travel again and in the same places and new places. Um, I will tell you about probably two or three topics today. Um, I will give a totally unnecessary introduction to Mendelian randomization, so I will gloss over it very quickly and move on to um, one topic on um, uh, improvements to standard IVWMR, which is a method that everybody is using and is the go to the first method that uh, we use uh, in causal inference in general. And everybody knows it has its own biases and it has its weaknesses. And uh, we developed uh, a method with, with Nino, uh, who is actually currently in Exeter as a postdoc. And she used to be a PhD student in my group uh, to, to try to amend some of these problems. Uh, should I sitting in front? Uh, yeah, sorry, those who are online, they can't see. OK, so I, I stay here. Uh, and the second topic will be uh, something which pushing uh, the limits of Mendelian randomization more towards uh, assessing cause and effect of a trait of an individual on the same trait in the partner uh, in couples using UK biobank data. And if there's time, I will also show some uh, work we did on nonlinear Mendelian randomization, uh, trying to assess a uh, nonlinear relationship between risk factors and, uh, and outcomes. Um, so I will go very quickly here. When you see correlation plots like this, uh, for example, of chocolate consumption per capita uh, per country versus the number of Nobel Prize winners per uh, 10 million capita, you see a very strong correlation and Switzerland is stopping both. So that's why I like to show it. But it's of course, uh, it's not because people eat a lot of chocolate that makes them smart to win Nobel Prizes, but there's a confounding factor as um, GDP. And if you allow uh, for more financial resources, then that can fund more research. More research can lead to no, more Nobel prices and also higher socioeconomic standards uh, can afford people consuming more luxury products such as chocolate. So uh, that's a very simple solution. So of course, Mendel randomization is offering uh, some sort of solution and I will not go much into details where we use genetic instruments uh, as an intervention as mimicking an intervention of randomized controlled trials where some people are born with certain genetic markers and that sort of creates uh, two arms, those people who are born with BMI increasing alleles and those who are not, for particular, F, let's say the FTO locus. And then you can follow these people up and to see how in terms of diabetes prevalence, these two groups develop. And if they have differences in diabetes prevalence, you assume or you hope that it's because they are bound to have different weight. And because of that, uh, obesity has a causal effect on diabetes. And so it's really just mimicking this, this trial. And of course, the big if here uh, is, um, is um, pleiotropy, because we are assuming all the effects going through only the exposure. And then the, the confounder, uh, any of the confounder of this relationship should be unrelated to the, to the genetic marker. So of course, uh, these kind of pleiotropic effects are all over the place. So that's why we are quite worried in using MR, Mendeley randomization, uh, using a single instrument. They try to combine together multiple instruments and hoping that these pleiotropic effects cancel each other out and eventually that will not be an issue. But of course, you can have some of these effects acting through heritable confounders, which will have an impact both on exposure and outcome. And those will also yield causal effect looking like, so that they will have still proportional effects on exposure and outcome while in reality, even if there is no causal effect. So there are many ifs here. And essentially, anytime you hear talk about MR, it will be always about that it's a method which tries to solve some of the problems. So MR is full of problems, and we try to make some assumptions uh, to elevate some of the other assumptions. And this is just one plot on uh, BMI effect on diabetes. Uh, very convincingly, the 324 or so markers that I used here, if you fit a regression line on the effects of these SNPs, each dot is a SNP here, and you plot their effects on the exposure of BMI versus their effect of types of diabetes, you can see a 
nice linear trend, and that confirms the well-known relationship, causal relationship between BMI and diabetes. And then you can push it more towards traits that are less usual to do MR on, uh, for example, lifespan. Here in the study, we did a multivariable Mendelian randomization where we assess the impact of multiple risk factors. So this is, is Nino's work, multiple risk factors on lifespan. And actually, not surprisingly, uh, smoking is one of the biggest killers, of course, which reduces lifespan the most possible. Um, but um, of course, the intensity also matters. So you can aggravate further the more you smoke, and then you can remove the effect of smoking by stopping smoking simply. Of course, it matters time. And then anytime you talk about MR, we very rarely talk about the temporal aspect that we can rarely really assess the, the impact of at which age does this exposure matters by how much. And there are just a few exceptions because we currently don't have enough data for that. Uh, what has a positive impact is education and education just because it's a good proxy for social economic status. And that's because spending years at school necessarily makes you live longer. But essentially every year you spend in education it's given back to you because you live exactly one year longer. Uh, so MR is very good because it can put you exact numbers uh, on the estimates, whether you trust it or not, it's another question. Uh, but now I, I move on to questioning some of these results. So uh, the general MR, uh, IBW MR method is estimating a causal effect by using an inverse variance weighting meta-analysis of ratio estimates or effect estimate on the export outcome divided by exposure. So what MR is really this method is doing is selecting SNPs from genome wide and setting only the significant SNPs and then using only those ones to uh, derive these ratio estimates. In reality, we know that the genetic architecture is pretty complex <clears throat> and still it's a very basic assumption what we use as a spike and slab distribution that we assume that a small fraction of the genome is actually causal. So that's the effect size distribution of, of variants that have an impact on the trait. And uh, there is a, a big, the bulk of the genome should have no effect on the trait, uh, no causal effect. Of course, in reality, we see far more associations because the association signals are smeared because of the LD. So if you have even a co single causal variant, because of linkage disequilibrium, there will be many, many other variants also just nominally associated with the trait in a marginal fashion. So, but uh, this is widely expected. And when we fit such models to, to large data sets, we see that uh, typically 5 to 10% of the genome seems to be causally related to traits. <clears throat> and the remaining ones are often following a normal or a mixture of Gaussian distribution. And it's a fairly simplistic but reasonable assumption that that's how the genetic architecture is. So we assume that with some probability, the effects are coming from a normal distribution, and uh, one minus the probability, the effects are zero. So what uh, the IBW estimate is doing is um, this linear regression model, or, 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 or the, the inverse variance weighted uh, world estimates, uh, which is the product of the effects divided by the product of the exposure uh, square, effect squares. What is not considered here at all that this is a selection process. It's not that we know in advance which variants to look at, but we look at the genome, we select the variants, typically in the very same sample, and once they are selected, we use them in this estimator. So what, what is not modeled is that actually we have the whole distribution effect, and we only use some arbitrary threshold <coughs> uh, of these test statistics, and we say, okay, we are only looking at these SNPs, and these are the ones that we'll be using in the estimator. So we have this, uh, in reality, what uh, the IBW uh, method is doing is it calculates these products, but pro conditioned on that the SNP was selected, <clears throat> meaning that the SNPs either you was below a certain threshold, or in other terms, uh, the effect size was larger than, the standardized effect was, size was larger than some threshold. So, and second, what IBW is doing is assuming that there is, um, no covariance between these effects, assuming that there is no overlap between the, this, the, the, the exposure and the outcome associations of summer statistics where they are coming from. So we can extend this, and after some very cumbersome algebra, we could derive the estimate. But before going to the estimator, 
uh, or the correction, uh, let's just assume that the data is really coming from a Gaussian distributed effect sizes from some heritability. And uh, there is some confounder, uh, non-heritable confounder here. And if you assume that the <clears throat> exposure and the outcome samples are not overlapping, then this is how uh, much bias you will get in your IBW estimator. As a function of the confounder strength, there's no change because there's no overlap between the samples. If there's no sample overlap, then it doesn't matter how strong the confounder was, the bias will be the same. Uh, here on this plot, you see that if you increase the selection threshold, your bias is decreasing. So it's good to be very strict, but of course it also reduces power. So it's a trade-off. Definitely increasing exposure sample size is something very good to do because that reduces bias. So this is, was the true estimate and we are approaching this with the IVW estimator. But as you can see, if you just have a few thousand or tens of thousands of samples in this particular setting, your estimator will be massively under uh, downward biased. Um, and the heritability of the exposure also helps. If your heritability is low, again, you have a lot of bias, the more the heritability, the better it will be. So in all these plots, I just uh, fixed all parameters except one, and I varied that parameter to show how much uh, the bias of IBW estimator depends on that parameter. So you can see the bias is there. It depends on a lot of factors, the strength of the confounding, the threshold, the heritability, the polygenicity, the sample size, and so on and so forth. Now, what happens if there's an overlap between the samples? So when the exposure sample and the outcome sample, they had an overlap, <clears throat> which is actually almost all the time the case. In that case, uh, the, the confounder strength has now a role, and the stronger the confounder, uh, when there is uh, the product is zero, when there is no confounder, there's no bias, but otherwise uh, the effect is linear, same thing with the threshold, the higher threshold you go, the smaller the bias you, you will approaching the true value of the parameter of the causal effect. Sample size again helps, a uh, larger sample, the less bias you will get, and heritability, heritability is again, uh, the higher the better. So you can see that it depends on many, many parameters in a very complex fashion. And that's when we derive this formula, which has all these parameters in, so you might recognize this is basically related to the exposure heritability, this is the causal effect. This is the polygenicity of the exposure. This is LD score regression intercept. Um, this is sample size of the exposure. This is the, the threshold for selecting the instruments and so on and so forth. So all these parameters are in this equation. And this equation just tells us that how much bias do we expect to get if we apply IBW estimator. But it's very handy because if you know how much bias we, we expect to get as a function of all these different parameters, we can correct for it and we can remove this bias. Now, when we correct for something, the, the correction factor itself has its own variance. So we reduce the bias, but we increase the variance. So in, here, in reality, it might even happen that we are in, 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 uh, increasing the root mean square error, so the estimation error. Luckily, it's not the case. So this is how the estimation error changes as a function of the p value selection threshold and the sample size overlap. <coughs> So here, the dark colors are 100% overlap, and the lightest color is 0% sample overlap between exposure and outcome. And you can see that even if you fix the threshold <coughs> of, of the SNP selection, so typically genome-wide significant uh, selection is here, the error is different and because of the different bias, depending on the sample overlap. Uh, while we correct, when we apply this bias correction based on the formula, so basically just taking the IVW estimator and remove this bit from here to make it unbiased, we increase a little bit the, 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 the estimation error, uh, but we reduce the bias. And what happens is that now all our estimators, or all our errors are much lower and uh, much more consistent. Uh, so it, it depends of, of how many fold, but it, this is just one particular setting. We, we have tested it in at least 20 different settings, and this is always the case. So that, that's good news. We moved on to test it on real data, where uh, one very popular way of testing an MR method is that you test BMI effect on BMI. And then you can take by UK by bank sample, you can take two subsets, and you can vary how much these subsets will overlap. 
and you estimate the causal effects of the uh, based on these two um, pretending to be exposure and outcome, while the exposure and outcome traits are the same trait. So you expect that the causal effect must be one because it's the same trait. But when you do MB, uh, IVW MR, this is the estimate you get. So it's heavily downward biased. While our corrected effects are always consistent with one, but still there is a slight trend here. Uh, this is an SBP on SBP. So the same situation as before, but now we change the trait. We again expect causal effect of one, and IVW underestimates, and we bring it back to a more sensible estimated. Now, if you look at cross traits, so BMI, let's say, on, on blood pressure, this is again a well-known positive control. We know there must be an effect. But if you see, if you just run a simple um, MR, <clears throat> and you vary the threshold for which you will select the SNPs, the instruments for, your answer will be different, depending on the threshold. Of course, the lower threshold, the more weak instrument bias you get. And you can see how the F statistic is going down as you decreasing the threshold. And of course, here also there's a danger of your selecting SNPs that are in reality not even associated with the exposure. So you can see that with the, with the standard IVW method, these are increasing uh, for the fact that there is a weak instrument bias. And also, the separate overlap has an impact on the estimator. So you get very heterogeneous estimates. So you don't know which one to use because you could choose any threshold and you could choose any sample overlap. In theory, they all should give you the same result. Uh, for a corrective method, these are much more homogeneous. So depending, it doesn't matter how much sample overlap you had, the effects are, are, are varying less. But of course, there's still a variation as a function of the threshold. And this is true biology, basically. If you use instruments that are uh, weaker, they typically tend to be or could be different biological pathways, how they act on the exposure. The weaker the instruments you use, the more likely that these are indirect effects. And the larger, the strongest ones, probably more direct effects. So these are probably biologically different pathways, which may lead to different causal effect estimates. Uh, so this is real, and I think this is real biology, and I think no method would correct for it. A uh, similar story for BMI effects on alcohol. Um, again, the effects are more heterogeneous before correction, and after correction, they become uh, much more stable. So we hope uh, that, that this shows that actually this bias reduction uh, approach that we propose for IBW is actually truly improving it while slightly increasing the variance, but it actually reduces the bias. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about this topic. I don't know if I should stop for questions now, or if you have any quick questions now, just feel free to interrupt in a way. No, okay. So let's move on to sexier topics. Let's talk about couples. So this is work by Jenny, who used to be a postdoc in my group. Um, so this is a work in progress, where it's hopefully almost accepted now for publication. So the, our question was that when we look at phenotypic similarity in partners, you will see that for traits like BMI, for educational attainment, for height, couples are much more similar to each other. And there could be many reasons for it. And of course, one reason is, uh, is true assortment, is that you, on, on purpose, you choose partners that are more similar phenotypically to you uh, with respect to important phenotypes. It can also be that both of you are either from uh, have the same religion, same social economic status, you're from the same region of the country, and all of these can be confounders uh, that can lead to phenotypic similarity of people who tend to be couples. There can be also, when you look at just couples like uh, at a given time point, cross-sectional in the UK biobank, those individuals are also uh, have already lived together. So the longer they live together, the more similar they might become just by sharing the household, sharing the diet, sharing physical activity, and so on and so forth. So there are really many different reasons why people are more similar phenotypically. And our aim was to figure out uh, what contributes by how much to this phenotypic similarity. <clears throat> so this is one uh, area where we can also apply MR. Uh, but here, it's even trickier to assume, uh, to basically assure that the assumption to hold. So here, the exposure would be a trait in a woman. And the outcome is the same trait in the partner, uh, the man. So we can take the genetic markers. Let's say, imagine this is BMI. I'm taking genetic markers <clears throat> that are associated with BMI. 
And if I know their effects on uh, an individual, I can also estimate the effect of the genetic marker on the partner in the UK Biobank, because we have about at least 50,000 partners in the UK Biobank. So we can just run a GWAS on someone's genotype and regressing it onto uh, someone's phenotype, someone, the partner's phenotype, by regressing the opposite. So basically take this and regress it onto the partner's genotype. So this way, we have the effect of the genetic marker on the partner's trait, and we also know the effect of this genotype on the individual. So we have these two effects, and with these two effects, we can all now estimate the causal effect of a trait of an individual on the partner. Again, subject to many, many problems that there can be pleiotropic effects going from this marker to the, uh, to the partner uh, phenotype. But for the moment, let's live in an ideal world that uh, there is no such violation. Still, there is an issue that uh, just the fact that we, we observe even a causal effect or a phenotypic similarity, it might be due to indirect assortment. So there can be a trait <coughs> under which people really assort, and there's a correlated trait for which there is absolutely no assortment. And uh, because of this, we still see a correlation for this trait, but there is really no choice for this other trait. The real choice is made for something else, which is potentially genetically correlated to the trait that we are studying. So basically, this really looks like a confounder because if you look at this plot, this is the trait in a woman, this is the trait in a partner, this is a confounder trait in this in the same individual and the partner, and it really the this group together looks like a confounder of this x-x relationship, and this is this uh, indirect assortment uh, situation, and this is quite difficult to find. So this is a busy slide. You're not supposed to read it. Basically, we just took all the buyback samples, uh, removed non-white, uh, non-British, blah, 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 the usual ones, the PC outliers. Um, so that we had arrived at the typical 330,000, 340,000 uh, remaining samples uh, that were unrelated. And then uh, we asked the UK Biobank if they could share with us the household information. So we looked at people who live at the same household. And then in the same household, we applied a couple of filters that we excluded people who had any sort of um, uh, kinship. Uh, so they really want unrelated individuals. <clears throat> we removed the, uh, we also looked at only heterosexual pairs. I mean, it doesn't change anything because the numbers are small. And, uh, and also we, we wanted to all really take those people who indicated that they lived with their partner or, or, or husband or wife. So in the end, we ended up with about 50,000 couples. Uh, this is not a very strict selection. Many other papers that you might read about uh, couples in the biobank, they are much stricter. And for example, they want that people report the same income, the same uh, water household size, the same number of uh, people in the household, the same number the, that they, they live for the same number of years at the same household and so on and so forth. We didn't filter on that one for the moment. In terms of trades, uh, we looked at a uh, pretty large number of traits, but then we looked at only traits that show a phenotypic correlation between partners of at least 0.1 uh, that already narrowed things down. And eventually with a couple of other filters, they, of course, we want to do an MR, so it has to be instrumentable. So we want, wanted to have at least five independent instruments and so on and so forth. So in the end, we ended up with 118 sort of non-redundant uh, arbitrary chosen, sort of arbitrarily chosen non-redundant phenotypes. Uh, so we asked, of course, you can ask many questions. The first question was, is there evidence for convergence that the longer the people live together, the more similar they become? In general, it's not really true. And there are a few traits uh, for which we saw evidence. For example, interestingly, uh, body fat percentage is one of them, meaning that it's more important when you are not together too long and it's becoming less and less important as you age. So it's like important for choice, but you don't, you, you diverge sort of afterwards. There is also an important, that also caveats about this data set, but uh, of, obviously when we're looking at people here, these are people who have been selected that they are still together at this age. So there might have been people who could have stayed together this long, but they didn't, and God knows what happened to their phenotype and how similar they would have been. So of course, this is maybe, uh, when, when the effect is going up, maybe this is super important to stay together. 
but for example, I don't know how difficult it is to survive to live with a smoking partner. If you don't smoke, I don't know. But here it seems that it goes up the similarity. So if you, even if you were not uh, discordant in terms of smoking, you tend to be more concordant as you live together longer. Uh, uh, this is this might be something arbitrary, just some medication use, which also tends to be uh, more concordant, coherent uh, within household. But in general, we hope to see uh, a trend uh, overall for all the 118 traits, at least to some extent, but we don't see that. <coughs> now, we also asked whether, as you can see on the, on the graph, you can ask what is the effect of a female person in a, in a couple on the male, and what's the effect of the male on the female? As opposed to correlation, which has no directionality, here it's causal effect, so we can ask this directionality because we are asking here really what, what's the female genotype's effect on the female, which is actually very, very similar to the male, but what's the effect of the female genotype on the male outcome versus what's the uh, correlation between the male genotype and the female outcome? And it's, it's a two different question. And you're using two orthogonal data sets. Um, so here's just a list of the 118 traits. So I thought uh, I could let you try and guess. Uh, I have a list here only three that, that uh, show nominally, at least nominally significant difference between the two directions. So women on men versus men on women. So among these traits, I, I give you two minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can see it or it's too small. Oh, it's too small, okay. I don't give you any time then. So uh, actually the, the three traits that came up was body fat mass, a uh, job type, and number of sexual partners in life. And it's everywhere the female were pickier, basically they, their effects were stronger on men than men were affected or, or on women. Uh, what's also interesting is that uh, although the nominally significant ones are not very numerous, uh, 15 out of those 64 traits where we at least see a, a causal relationship between uh, a trait on female versus a trait on male. That was nominally significant, so it's, a, it's almost a five-fold enrichment, which is uh, clearly significant. So although individual trait level, we cannot pinpoint really traits, but overall we see a trend that there is a difference. But this difference is probably not strong enough to be detected in this data set. And the female to male effects tend to be slightly larger, but well, again, this is borderline, so I don't want to dwell too much on this. So, so far, it's not very exciting. We've seen that there is not much effect that people don't seem to converge. Second is that uh, male-female effects are not that different from each other. Next question, what we asked is, uh, if you compare the correlation between the phenotypes and the causation, the causal effect of the phenotypes, can we observe some discrepancies? And indeed we do, and in general, of course, the correlations are larger than the causal effects. And here are just some examples where you see uh, massively larger um, causal effects, um, the correlations and causal effects. And very roughly speaking, the correlation itself in such a, such a setting, the correlation is determined by the strength of the confounder and the causal effect between the two constructs, two phenotypes. So if you see that the, co the correlation is larger than the causal effect, we assume that there must be some confounder. So it's an interesting to look at which traits might be impacting both. So for this, we asked in two ways. We first uh, looked at typical confounders that we can imagine, and then we looked at all 118 phenotypes to see, uh, so here you see 118 dots, and for each dot is one phenotype. <clears throat> and we asked whether the average total household income before tax as a confounder, how much of the observed correlation it would explain. So on the y-axis, I'm showing here that how much correlation would you see if there were only just this confounder effect present? And this confounder effect, uh, imagine this would be the income of the one person, the income of the partner, uh, that would be the average income. And then the effect, what you see, what you observe to see you know, on a trade such as, um, I don't know, consumption of chocolate or, or of cheese or whatever, any kind of outcome, you see a correlation. The, the, uh, if there is no real causation here and it's only caused by some disconfounding factor, then the correlation, what you see here, it would be the y to x causal effect times the 
the associated mating causal effect of on for the y phenotype times again the y to x causal effect. So it would be the y to x causal effect squared times the causal effect or even similarity, cannot be similarity, or for another trait that would be the expected uh, correlation that we expect. If there is nothing else acting, there is no causation here. It's purely because of the confound. So that's what I'm showing on the right axis, on the y axis, and on the x axis I just show simply the couple trait correlation. So for for a given trait. So for the given trait, you can estimate how much would be the correlation if it were only entirely the correlation between these two uh, traits would be due to household income on the y-axis and on the x-axis what I actually observe. Of course, if it's, it's the same, it means that everything I observe is due to the single confounder. Uh, naturally, it's not. Uh, only a fraction of the couple correlation can be explained by a fixed confounder, such as income tax, and tax, uh, basically income. And But you can still see that about 30% of the total couple correlation can be explained just by this single confounder. Uh, it, of course, these uh, these two are very correlated confounders. Uh, age uh, at, uh, co when we completed full time education, it explains eleven percent. You can see here that still the correlations are much larger than we could we could predict or we could assume them if they were just due to this uh, their correlation to education level. And of course, these two are are highly correlated variables, so you can't just sum, sum them up. Uh, it was interesting also uh, going to sports club or gyms also is, is, is quite neat, quite a strong confounding factor. And there are a couple of smoking and overall health. And, and interestingly, what we thought it would be a very strong confounder is, is place of birth. Actually, it barely explains anything. Uh, so it's not, not a very interesting one. So when you see traits that fall here, those are heavily confounded by this particular trait. And traits that fall here on this line, those are the ones that are not much impacted by that uh, trait. This, this one. Okay, so so far I did, I picked the confounder and I checked for all traits how much impact they have on this confounder. What we did next is that now I fix a trait and I look for all possible confounders <coughs> and to see how much each confounder contributes. And again here, we just estimated what's the impact of these different confounders uh, on this observed relationship. And we found, uh, of course, plenty of examples and, and tons of confounders. Many of these confounders, of course, correlated to each other. So you can't just sum them up and add them up, their effects. Uh, but um, for example, even BMI and physical activity are, are of course, correlated confounders. But when we look at systolic blood pressure, <coughs> couples tend to have a 0 0.16 correlation in terms of their blood pressure measurement, which is, of course, far higher than just random pairs and population. But the causal effect estimate was only 0 0.05. So much more smaller. So we assume that there must be confounders there. And it seems BMI and physical ed education are two very strong confounders that can explain a large fraction of this difference. Again, here uh, we estimated the causal effect of BMI and BMI, physical education, physical education in the index and the partner. Uh, we estimated the causal effect of BMI on systemic blood pressure, physical education on, on systemic blood pressure, and we estimated what might be this path here in total and that path here in total. And, and we see that quite a lot of this difference can be explained uh, by, by these two patterns. If you look at weight, uh, here the difference is smaller. Not surprisingly, of course, the more fat uh, percentage somebody has, typically the more weight that person has, which is one of the confounders. Interestingly, TV watching comes up as a confounder which is quite controversial, but uh, basically any MR we do, TV watching seems to be causally related to, to adiposity and, and BMI and overweight and obesity traits. Uh, physical uh, activity is not surprisingly also uh, a confounder here. So we don't have that much difference, but we have several different confounders that could each are correlated to each other, could uh, explain this relatively smaller difference here. I one step even further, and in our, not looking at the effect of one trait on, on the same trait, but we look at one trait in an index individual, what is its causal effect in, the, uh, in another trait, on another trait in a partner. Uh, this is because Albert and Eza, uh, in, in, in Edinburgh, they did an, a very nice paper on, on comparing going cross trait and, and looking at how correlations and genetic correlations across traits like what is the genetic correlation between a individual's phenotype and the partner's other phenotype, and how much this can be explained by, by different paths. 
And the conclusion was that there, there are some SNPs, uh, there are some examples where there's a direct effect here. So in our experience, in our example, in, at least in an MR setting, it's not really too much the case that if you see such a diagonal effect, which moves from an individual and the phenotype to another phenotype in another individual, uh, obviously the most obvious, uh, the, the, the clearest path is you move in the same individual first, uh, sorry, in the same individual first, you move to the other trait, and that other trait has a causal effect on the same trait across individuals, or you move from one individual to another, but in the exposure trait, and then you uh, see the causal effect in the partner between X and Y. So that's what we put rho as an effect which goes first uh, within an individual, and uh, the gamma is the effect which goes first across partners and then within an individual. And then we have this total effect, this total diagonal effect. And what we observe is that in general, these gamma effects are larger, are significantly larger. So it's more often happening that you first go across partners in the exposure and then you move to the outcome, as opposed to going the other way that you move within the same individual and then you move across partners. Uh, both of them are smaller than the total effect that we observe. But if you put the two of them together, of course, the two paths are somewhat correlated. Uh, then, and if you correct for this correlation uh, to some imperfect way, uh, then we pretty much get back the total effect. So we see very little evidence where there is a diagonal effect from one trait of an individual to another trait of another individual of the partner, which is not going through one of these two paths, which is quite reassuring, in my opinion. Uh, here are some examples, though, where this total effect was different, was larger than any of the other passes together. <clears throat> and an interesting one is smoking effect on, on leukocyte counts, where it might be the effect of passive smoking uh, on the partner trait. So it's not only smoking itself, you, uh, you change the, the smoking of your partner, which you've already seen that there is a, a sort of making, there is a, there's a causal effect. And then smoking itself has, a, has an effect in, in the same person's leukocyte count. But really, maybe this person smoking has a passive smoking effect on the other uh, part of the leukocyte counts. And there have been some papers which were linking passive smoking with, uh, with, with certain blood, uh, blood counts. Uh, other ones which are very clearly going one way, for example, is lack fat percentage and TV watching. So lack fat percentage is the exposure. First, it goes to TV watching. And then TV watching in you induces the higher TV watching in a partner. Uh, similar T comes up again here, when TV is the exposure, then it first, your TV watching impacts your partner's TV watching, and then your partner's TV watching impacts your partner's BMI, which seems that somehow you are much more assorting for TV watching than for BMI. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's true, uh, maybe it's convergence, I don't know. Uh, but doesn't matter if TV watching was the exposure or the outcome, it determines which path will be uh, stronger and the path where TV watching is jumping between partners is usually the preferred path. Uh, of course, the reviewer uh, asked that, okay, this is all biased. I mean, there have been many papers about showing that if there's associative mating, uh, MR is not working, MR will be biased. So we developed a specific model, which to our knowledge, nobody has really looked at this specific uh, setting where we have a, an exposure in an individual and uh, the outcome is the same phenotype in another individual. And we are trying to assess all possible violations of the mark, not all possible, some that we could think about. So if this trait has a genetic component and has an environmental component. So all these two are in going here. Now there is a, 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 a sort of mating for this trait. I called it Rx, which I simply call it basically the phenotypic uh, similarity between those two traits. And there's also, there can be a genetic similarity for the genetic component of these traits. But this really means direct genetic effect, which can happen through another phenotype. For example, these, uh, these SNPs are also correlated with another phenotype. That phenotype undergoes a sort of mating, and it goes back. And that's how this uh, genetic correlation uh, gives rise to. Uh, there's this genotype of the offspring. This is the genotype of the parents. So here, I, I, for simplicity, I take average parental genotype, which has, of, of course, an impact on the parental uh, trait. And there is the parental environment. Now, the, the parental environment, of course, can have a direct effect on the offspring environment. 
and then through this path it reaches here. So the the offspring genotype is of course correlated with parental genotype. The parental genotype is correlated with the parental trait. The parental trait can have a causal effect on the offspring uh, environment, and that can have an impact on the offspring trait. So you can see that the genetics of the offspring can have a direct effect and then can have various indirect effects on the phenotype. And this, of course, happens on the, um, <clears throat> on the partner side. So these are, this was our basic DAG. Uh, it's not even a DAG because it has these weird non-arrows, which are just means assortment. And under this model, uh, yeah, we could show that the causal effect of the IVW estimator is the true value, so this true assortment, plus some bias. And this bias depends on a couple of factors. And obviously, all these uh, parent offspring links are giving rise to the bias, because if there is a genotype here, which can have an effect here, 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 to x, but also the same way it can go through here, 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 here to the outcome, now this will introduce a bias, because it will be clearly violent in the bar assumption, because this is absolute pleiotropy. Uh, so this is not, not very difficult to derive, but this allows us at least to see how the bias depends on the uh, different parameters. Uh, so the key, key, uh, the key violations here are you need to have, uh, if this is present, this is non-zero, and the sx is non-zero, then there's a violation. So this is a pretty strong one. Uh, that's what I listed here. Uh, the, this violation doesn't seem to cause any problem because there is no path uh, from G uh, to X through, uh, through E by SE. There's the genetic violation, which can go through here, here. The, and then there is the, the SX violation. So this one is, is not the strongest. This one is a weaker violation, which eventually is there. When, uh, for example, when this is not zero, this is, imagine a trait where I just give an example of this is BMI, this is gym going. Uh, the two are, uh, if you go to the gym, you tend to reduce your BMI. Uh, of course, partners uh, often might go to gym together. They, they often have a stronger assortment, a stronger similarity instead of uh, for gym going than for BMI. And uh, this can lead to a, a pretty big upward bias. So you overestimate the BMI similarity just because you count in the gym going, uh, which is an addition. Um, so these there are different violations that can give to rise to different biases in, in, in this uh, causal effect estimate. But what you can see is that generally the, this RG has very small impact on the, on the causal effect estimation, while um, the RE has really the, the major component. And if you look at the, the effect of, of SX or SG, uh, SG typically seems to have a smaller effect, which makes sense. So typically these are these these genetic direct, direct effects uh, can never really happen directly, but usually through another trait. Uh, so <coughs> S, really S, X, and R, E are the key components which give rise to the largest bias. So that's what we have to keep uh, looking for. Uh, here you can see if you have a large R, E, and large S, X, so these are the two largest components, then you can get a, a really large bias while for most of the other combinations, it's not really substantial. Okay, so another question is that, shall I quickly go through polynomial MR or rather have more questions? Depends on, I can already ask you, do you have questions? And then if you have done, then I'll go, go ahead. Well, just saying, come on about the, the graph that's really nice. So one clearer way to explain it to people is, um, just go back to the partner one before that, the simple one. You know, that's just a picture for a bidirectional MR. And, and the way the main mistake people make in explaining that is that it, it, it's, it's the previous one. It's, it's actually two DAGs superimposed. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, it's that one that was two DAGs superimposed. So you see, the subsequent one is, is the same, it's for each direction. Sorry, is it the right plot? I'm sure. Yeah, that, that one's right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, here, yeah, that's all that really is is, is two DAGs superimposed. One exactly. So yeah, it's very true. So it's not a deck anymore. Yeah. There's a problem. And second is, is you could simplify it because there's this infinite loop in there, uh, which basically just means a constant multiplier of every effect that you see. And then you can, in theory, replace with one arrow only. But when, when you actually program it or, or when you want to simulate data, it's not that straightforward. 
bigger on? It might be a, a really silly question, but um, when you're looking at the female um, effect on male and vice versa, uh, do, are, are the instrumental variables defined in a, a female only group, or have you just used general um, sort of mixed? Yeah, so we did it in multiple ways. It doesn't make too much difference. So, what's very important is that for the outcome, we have to really do it sex specifically. So, that has to be a sex specific. Uh, genotype in male versus phenotype in women and then opposite, and those are important. Uh, in terms of instrument selection, we figured that uh, it's better to, to use instruments from a large GWAS instead of just running only in the female individuals the GWAS and only in the male individuals the GWAS, but then we can re-estimate the effect of those instruments on the exposure specific, sex specific as well. And if you do that, that doesn't make much difference. Uh, but what's key is really the, the exposure outcome that has to be really in a very spec specific common estimation. But yeah, that's a good point. It's uh, I don't know what the best one. Is there another question? Mr. Samara. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm just wondering about the associative mating and collider bias. Um the, the couples that survive to be included in the analysis could be influenced by the traits themselves. Is that, is that not a problem? I don't, I don't see how that might be being solved by the sensitivity analysis that you're showing. Sorry, uh, once again, so how, how so I sort of mating? So if, if like the longevity of a relationship is influenced by some of the traits, then amongst the couples for which you have access, those traits will become correlated. Ah, oh, okay. Um, but I don't know how much that's the case, but I expect it probably does happen, but I would have thought that that would be the major cause of concern for bias in this analysis, but... I think those, because then that would be another trait here, which would be longevity. But which mm -hmm. both, so you basically you, you select the individuals based on, I think that, that effect would be just multiplying too much, too many effects. So the effect of, of genotypes in general on longevity is extremely tiny and it's rarely ever direct. Sorry, not longevity, longevity of the relationship. Ah, sorry, so okay, okay. Yeah, like, um... but then you assume that that would have a genetic basis uh, or a detectable one. Well, I suppose like, that's a good question. If there's some to... characteristic that causes a relationship to succeed, that mm -hmm. they'll be in the... Yeah. And then, like, that could be related to lifestyle factors and all sorts of socioeconomic things, so... Yeah, I guess if those have a huge impact, that's definitely... Because that effect actually squares, because then, then whatever comes here as a, as a selection, uh, which is like the, 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 the length of the relationship, then it would have an effect. It has to go through here, back, and this has to be both related to that one rather yeah. strongly. So it would be a product of too many things. I think that the effect would be probably small. It's a bit like when we observe, when we look here, the different contributions. It's once it goes through a too long path, the effects just keep multiplying and becomes very small. But we haven't checked particularly how strong uh, any of the examined traits should have on on the length of the relationship. Yeah, I mean, we could actually just test simply correlation of traits on the length. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. That was a, a question. So, so two population genetic phenomenon which are created by sorts of mating are cross chromosome genetic correlations. Mm -hmm. So, genetic association, which isn't down yeah. And then, secondly, gene types being out of RDY and very equilibrium. So, for example, at the ADH1B <coughs> being out of body when one of the people that brings it always is, uh, might be because of sorts of amazing art. Exactly. Yeah. Sort of um, so, you do things like exclude just variants out of H. Yeah. H uh, really like problematic. But what is it? Did, did you follow up? You could follow these, these up by looking at sort of polygenic, polygenic cross chromosome um, correlations. To, to find out if that, is, if that makes if that makes sense in terms of which uh, which traits have the, the strongest uh, cross chromosome correlation to account for that the extent to which the, the, the polygenic scores will explain the trait. 
because the more resource you're making, there's the stronger that should that should that should be. But I've never seen anyone triangulate the hazards. Yeah, no. So you know, Peter Fisher's paper in uh, the genetics where they looked at uh what are the scores from even versus of chromosomes and they correlated to each other to, to get uh estimates and it was super underpowered so even they took the largest possible studies and they checked bmi education height or something like this and it could just barely detectably show that there is some evidence for it so i think that that's that would be good to but that would be still bound that would be still biased by any confounding or indirect assortment so, um, but but yeah, that, that could be just simply confirming if the correlation that we see for, for the traits are correct. Uh, I'm just worried that for how many traits would we have the power to see that? Because you need to have a very good polygenic score for that. And that's why I think they on purpose, they, they use the traits like height. But you need that's detectable, yeah. Good point. So, you are the chair, you should be saying. Please continue. <laughs> we have an hour, right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, I will definitely keep on. Okay, so another question which uh, people don't ask frequently enough, in my opinion, is, is nonlinear relationship. They always, every MR method, everything that I showed so far, what we are doing ourselves, and not exceptions, we are blind to nonlinear effects. And nonlinear effects are maybe not that they are interesting if they are close to linear or monotonic, but the interesting bits are definitely ones where become a, a non-monotonic relationship that initially it increases the risk and it decreases the risk. So it will be very interesting to, to study. And um, so when we looked at it uh, first a uh, few years ago, I was surprised to see there's actually one single paper uh, by Stephen Burgess, the Lace paper, which, which dealt with it. And then there are some extensions since then which I don't want to comment on, but they're totally unusable software and very, very difficult to apply. And it takes like 10 minutes to run for a single trade. So I'm not going to name anyone. Uh, it's not here anyway, but, but so it's, it's um, in general, the, the LACE was the only usable method to, to detect this. And so I was wondering, that could we, because it's, it's highly non-parametric, uh, can we improve increased power by assuming something about the, the, the shape of, of this function? which is here. So we obviously want to instrument everything by, by genetic markers. So these are the genetic markers, which give us the polygenic score for a given phenotype. And now instead of just asking what's the effect of this phenotype on an outcome, uh, we can look at different powers of this phenotype and assume that there is a polynomial relationship uh, between the actual, the true function and, and the exposure. So simply replacing this arbitrary function with the polynomial function. And we are asking, we are really just want to fit and understand these, these polynomial coefficients. And once we have the coefficients, we can go back and just visualize the curve itself and to see uh, how, how, it, how it looks like. Uh, and it's, it's quite easy to show and, uh, that, that uh, if you can just plug in the, the x, uh, you substitute this for x here, and uh, then, then you get this expression. And once you figure out everything, it turns out that actually you need to just fit two types of variables on y. You need uh, different powers of the exposure, and you need the residual error from the regression. Basically, that's the original trait minus the PRS, which is here, and different powers of the PRS, uh, the, the, the residual PRS. So the regression is, is fairly quick and simple, has some approximations, because we, we didn't here we just approximated this effect, uh, the, the polygenic score effect, uh, within the same study, which is not ideal, but Unfortunately, I took several weeks to derive a much more a smarter method, which is takes 10 times longer to run and it gives identical results. So, so it's really the simplest good sometimes. So this works very well uh, and it gives back causal effects. Uh, for example, we did a very large number of simulation studies with various genetic uh, architectures with varying number of causal SNPs, uh, exposures, different uh, confounder effects, quadratic confounder effects, non quadratic ones different sigmoid and other shaped causal uh, functions. And you see that here, you can see the exposure versus outcome, the effect of the outcome. And you can see here, for example, that the relationship observationally, if it looks like that, the true relationship is here, uh, uh, the, the, the green one, and the polyMR, so our estimate, is given by this dashed line. So it pretty much uh, recovers the estimator and it's within the, the, the confidence uh, hull. So, so, so far so good, even if you put a sigmoid function, which is non-polynomial non function, it can approximate it 
pretty well. And once you get more to the extremes, that's where it starts to deviate, as you can see. But the key point is that just observationally looking at the relationship between two traits and the causal relationship can be very different. Of course, this is just simulation here. Uh, an obligatory task was to compare it to LACE. So this is the root mean error by our polyamr method, and this is the root mean error by LACE, since LACE is uh, not assuming any, uh, any particular functional form. Of course, it, it, it has less power, but it's also more flexible. So as soon as we had a polynomial causal function, we, we massively, so the LACE error is, is, is much, much larger, like more than tenfold larger in some situations. So these are just truncated here. Even if there's non-polynomial one, we still seem to perform better. Of course, I'm sure that there exists a function where LACE will perform better, but didn't spend enough time to look at it. But we had still more than 50 different settings already. Uh, so it seems that assuming some sort of functional, some parametric uh, function of the causal relationship, it can help in, in to improve power and can also very nicely draw the curves and help us to, to get this notified person confidence halls to see how the relationship might be. We can also directly test, is there an evidence uh, that it's nonlinear uh, in a very simple fashion. We applied it in the UK biobank traits. Uh, I, I don't want to interpret them too much, but you can see the, uh, the advantage here is that we can see what observationally how the relationship looks like in the UK biobank between these two traits. Uh, sometimes the causal effects agreeing quite well, but you can still see that it's, it's nonlinear and non-monotonic, while MR is assuming that it's fully linear. In uh, some case, the observational one looks like fully monotonically going up, but then what you observe is some more so like an inverted U shape, which can be many explanations. Some maybe if you're diagnosed with hypertension, then you may act on your lifestyle and that reduces uh, obesity. One of the obvious advice is this to shed weight uh, when you uh, diagnose for hypertension or diabetes. So maybe that sort of effect, but there might be other biological effects. That's basically is it, clearly see a, a distinct pattern. Still for like half of these trait pairs that we were looking at, there is no, uh, there is no substantial interesting nonlinear trends. Of course, there's still a lot of linearity here. I'm just showing you the interesting ones, obviously. Um, observational trends can be, again, like cholesterol and BMI can be uh, quite weird. Uh, the causal effect seems to be much more consistently uh, going almost linearly. And then some cases like BMI lifestyle, which we suspected that must be some nonlinear effect because too high BMI or too, too low BMI might be equally uh, detrimental for lifespan. Um, it doesn't seem to be detectable here with this method. We still see uh, just, a, just a linear trend here. So in some cases, it's truly just linear and there is no point doing any sophistication. Uh, what's interesting is, is also we could do it sex specifically because for this kind of MR analysis, you need to have access to the raw data. This cannot be done just on summer statistics on association results. Uh, of course, you all know that in terms of body fat percentage, men and women have, have completely different uh, proportions. So men have lower, women have higher. But what you can see that if you do sex specific causal effects on, on, on uh, body fat percentage on cholesterol, LDL cholesterol levels, you can see that actually the, in terms of risk uh, for men and women uh, that, that they have this shifted fat percentage, it doesn't expose women to a higher uh, risk at all because it's just their relative, it's all relative to their population average, what matters. And we just mix the two samples together and we get a causal effect estimate of function. Uh, it would be a, a totally mixed message, mixed bag. While we, we, we clearly see that there is an optimal level for men and women and deviating from this optimum for men and women, it's equally bad for the two sexes, and the risk is comparable between the two sexes, despite the fact that the baseline level, the average is, is uh, far higher in terms of fat percentage for women than for men. Basic ratio is a different story. It seems that the same, the same value uh, will, will uh, give a, a much uh, the higher uh, risk. And you can see that the average basic ratio, of course, for, for women is lower than for men. Uh, but having the same value will not confer uh, the, the, the same uh, risk uh, in terms of uh, LDL levels. So what's very interesting about it is that we can detect nonlinear, uh, non-monotonic relationship and even sex-specific uh, non-linear and non-monotonic relationship with these kind of methods. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to tell you. And I just want to finish with uh, thanking my group and also saying that all these were done by people who are not anymore in the group. So I'm hiring new people in the group. So if you know anyone who is interested or you are interested, 
feel free to apply either the PhD or the postdoc. Thanks a lot. That's really brilliant. Thank you. Such productive work. Are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? So with the polyamor, um, just um, is there like a sort of a model selection process to understand the the complexity of the model? That's a good point, and that that's also probably a weak point of this because it's uh, uh, it's iteratively go growing the model. So it starts with the linear and then tries to add the quadratic term. Uh, if it doesn't work, it still tries to add uh, a cubic term and, and uh, still move on for a while, but afterwards stopping if you don't find anything significant. It can happen that you don't have a significant quadratic term, but you have a significant fourth order third, rather cubic term. So the problem is that uh, since we keep growing this model, training the same data, it would be more ideal to separate the training and test set in one we build the model and finally that model, once we fix which parameters are non-zero, because we go up to 10th order polynomial to be very flexible. And so of course we just stop up to five or four or three. And you can see that for some, we actually just stopped at the linear one. But, but there is some sort of uh, overfitting going on here because we didn't strictly separate the training and test set where we first, first fix which ones will be non-zero and then afterwards you want to fix those parameters. I see, yeah. So it's not, not perfect, it, it gives some, yeah, it leads to some bias. Why go to the square in the cubic root? Why not go to the power 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 1.3? 1 1 yeah. I mean, I don't know if it fits things better. Uh, first of all, we have uh, negative know, values. We can't put the square uh, fractions. It's easy to go on a calculator, but I mean, there's no reason that my biology should be squared, is there? Of course, no, no, no. I mean, the whole point is that for any function, you can use the Taylor series expansion, which will appro approximate the original function to arbitrary precision within a time interval. And we just try to approximate it with something stupid. So actually, uh, Jonathan so didn't like this because it was originally my idea. So, and then he said, uh, uh, when he was writing up his thesis, that he then implemented splines uh, and, and he used the um, different splines uh, to fit instead of polynomials. And actually that many times it, it works better on the edges, on the limits, which might be the interesting part. But yeah, uh, polynomials probably was not the best choice, but it's too late. <laughs> Seems to work pretty well. But like, yeah, avoiding like a sort of like AIC for like the um, penalizing the complexity that, that that wasn't required to like sort of control the type of error rate or anything like that. Uh, so type of error was 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 no problem. So we, we tested that extensively. Yeah. Uh, because just the fact that you fit a particular shape afterwards, you refit the, the coefficients. So it was it was not leading to inflated type of errors. Oh. Um, yeah. That's one of the smartest That's decisions. For the, for the last uh, part that you showed, the estimating all of these complex nonlinear effects, can you say something about the um, uncertainty or the that because like we're, we're often still struggling to get power to detect main effects, right? So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how, how are you able to to get these lovely curves out? So this is you get a coefficient estimate for each of the polynomial term, and then. Uh, you get from the fit the variance covariance matrix of the coefficients. So you can simulate many, many new times the coefficients from this estimated average and the covariance matrix. And then you repeat this and every time you get a different curve. And for each point uh, exposure level, uh, we just look at the 95% confidence interval of how much they vary. And of course, when, they, when you are exactly at population average, that's when you are you don't make any mistake because all your x values are zero because that's zero deviation from the mean. So that's why, of course, it's uh, it's like the further away you move from from the population mean, the, the larger your confidence hole will be. But indeed, uh, it doesn't mean that we are hundred percent confident that if you're a population mean that will be your value. You're, you're right. Yeah, that's uh, that's not reflected here indeed because of the restriction of the functional form. And I think it probably had we fitted everything 
Yeah, I think what's missing from here, and it's a good point, maybe is the is the interceptor. I'm not sure that you are you're simulating that in addition. So because yeah, the, the, I think the interceptor would be added here that that everywhere the same amount of noise. And you're right. I think that that should be checked. It's a good point. We might have turned over, um, but uh, should we thank Sultan once again for a really stimulating talk? Thank you.